This is Apostle Michael Orupo Messages channel. Today's message is speak about how to chisel for more. Be blessed as you listen to wisdom, utterances, revelation, wisdom by Apostle Mike. You know, there has been a bad contention that began even before man was built, before man was framed, before man was designed. There's been a warfare that predates the very existence of everything you see in the visible creation. In fact, the current visible realm was grossly attacked by that battle. So much so that the whole earth was in the state of chaos. It was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The emergence of this current civilization came out of a battle. The visible realm is a precipitate of a battle that took place even before you came. And that battle continues and it will continue to the end of this age. We were brought into battle and we will be carried out from battle. The Bible said, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And he said, the earth was void. The earth was empty. And he said, darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Hebrew word is Tohu, Tohu, and Shilkeas. There was an empty expanse of nothingness. Because of the battle that took place, one of the princes of Zion had fallen. He was the first governor of the earth. He ruled the universe. He knows the dimensions of the earth. The Bible said, Thou that weaken the nations. He was here as the prince that ruled over the visible realm. And he committed high treason in Zion. And when he was cast from heaven, he was cast to the earth. His collapse on the earth created a distortion in the balances of the visible realm. And the earth became void. A new government was established on the face of the earth and darkness was upon the face of the deep. God came and recreated this universe. God came and reshaped this realm. God came to restructure this realm so that a purpose that was in the heart of the Father, a purpose that was the tanner, that was designed to run through time and continue into eternity must find expression because the devil is too small to shock the will of God. Everything happening in this world is a stream of life that began from God and will end in God. The earth is only a transit point. The dimensions of eternity are breaking through this realm and they will pass through this realm back into eternity. So when God restructured the visible realm, it was to establish and to reenact a purpose he had in mind that the first creatures that lived on the earth could not carry out. And if we fail to carry it out, God can create again. So when God restructured the earth, he introduced another spaceman called man into the earth. The spaceman called man was designed to host him and to express his will so that that which he had in mind before the foundation of the world would find expression. But there was battle. And the one that was cast from heaven came back and deceived the man so that he would fall again. And from that time of deception, darkness had been on the face of this earth. And when we say darkness, we are not talking about the absence of light. Because the Bible said the light shines in the darkness. Darkness is not blackout. Darkness is actually the existence of spirits that are not in league with God. Darkness is actually the establishment of a government that is not consistent with the government of God. Darkness is the betting of a civilization that is not consistent with that which is in heaven. 
because the earth was supposed to be a mirror image of heaven. The moment the earth ceases to be a mirror image of heaven, the earth is in darkness. The moment the government of God is no longer expressed over a context, that context is in darkness. It can be as bright as daylight, but it's in darkness. The earth was void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And God said, He brought back His government. If you are not aware that there is a darkness in this realm, you will stroll through time and assume life is a form fair. You will never find it anywhere in scripture where it suggests that life is form. But there are too many places in scripture that reveal clearly that life is a warfare. Because darkness is on the face of the deep. Because there is a civilization that is existing here designed to reorient you and to turn you away from God. There is a culture that has been instituted in the world where you live that is tailored at making you becoming alien to the realm that is your nativity. If you walk through this realm, a point will come where you will become alien to the civilizations of heaven. It will become difficult for you to do the things that were supposed originally to be consistent with your DNA. That's why we struggle to pray. They don't struggle with prayer in heaven. They breathe in heaven by prayer. The way they breathe in Zion is by worship. They don't breathe oxygen in Zion. Zion is the realm of the glory of God. Adam was not breathing oxygen in Eden. Eden was a symphony of heaven. Eden was a vibration of the realms of heaven. Adam was breathing God. So everything Adam did was a testimony of worship. In the heavens, they don't breathe oxygen. They breathe God. So men don't struggle to worship in heaven. Worship is a perpetual continuum. It said the four beasts, they stood morning and night forever and ever. And what were they doing? Holy is the Lord. How can you say holy forever and ever? Except holy has become oxygen on your nostril. The same way you breathe morning and night. Even when you are sleeping, you are breathing. The Bible said, day and night, forever and ever. How can creatures be saying holy forever and ever? Because in heaven, breath is not oxygen. Breath is worship. So even in the night, all that comes after them is worship. But it is difficult for us to pray and to worship. The reason is because there is another government in this world. You have been taught another culture that is different from the culture of God. That's why you can watch movies from morning to night, but you can't pray from morning to night. It's difficult. You have been reoriented. Israel, the people of God, they have been in Egypt for too long. So even when they left the physical border of Egypt, Egypt was still in their heart. That's why even in church you are distracted. The culture, the civilization, the darkness of this world has found its footing in your heart to make you a citizen of another realm. But when God tabernacles a man, even when he walks in the visible realm, he is as tall as the cedars. Because while he is on earth, his head is in heaven. Jesus said, The Son of Man, which is in heaven, he was in Nazareth. But he was not only in Nazareth, he was in heaven at the same time. He said, everything I do is as I see the Father. So every time you see Jesus preaching, every time you see Jesus healing the sick, Jesus was watching the Father like a theater. So at all times, he was connected to heaven. Real time connected to heaven, the way you and I are communicating. Because that's how we live. When a man is not incorporated by this realm, he becomes a citizen of heaven who is only a pilgrim on the face of the earth. He can never lose his connectivity to Zion. When we talk subjects like pruning, we are not here to tell you what God wants to give you. We are here to tell you what God wants to make out of you. It is more blessed to be made than to be given. If I make you a millionaire, I have blessed you. If I give you one million, I may destroy you. Because if I have not made you, that one million may be the reason why you will die. Because the first thing you want to do is to go to a club. The first thing you want to do is to go to Bahama Island and find out what it looks like to lie on the beach in the afternoon. 
because you watch it in a movie. But if I make you a millionaire, you have control over the money. You will not only have money, but you have control over the money. So what God wants to do for us in this conference is to make men. That's why it will not necessarily be a time to manifest gifts of the Spirit, but it will be time to bring out the sword that shapes the heart of men. Hados, you are mighty on your throne. And you know, it's so unfortunate that when God begins to make, people are few. When God gives, there are many people that receive. But when God makes, there are few men. That's why in the generation, most times you end up hearing few names. They didn't start that few, they were many. They were very many. The fathers of faith that you hear their names being called, if they told you how they started, they were many. But some received from God, and they have spent what they received. But the ones that are made, they stand like the princes of Zion. They are like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. When God wants to make men become few, I pray that you'll be enlisted tonight. <laughs> you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Kai, Barakibo, Sazila, Vandika, Zata. Somebody will leave this conference and he will begin to pray like he breathes. <laughs> I was listening to Archbishop Duncan Williams and something entered me and I prayed from night to morning. It was like I was playing. And I asked myself, what happened? He said, I received an energy from a superior energy level. <laughs> Natural, the way I sleep and enjoy myself, I prayed through the night. I was enjoying myself. I said, what has happened? It's another energy. Sleep is an energy level. Prayer is an energy level. Somebody will leave this conference and he will pray like he breathes. <laughs> so John began to speak to us in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He said, I baptize you with water unto repentance. He said, But there cometh one greater than I. He said, This one will not baptize you with water. This one is coming to do something to you that is more radical than repentance. He said, He's coming to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Because I said to us from John chapter 15 verse 2, the way God prunes the people, one is by the baptism of fire. When God wants to prune a man, he doesn't come to teach him principles. Principles are important. But what God will do is that he will, burn, he will set him on fire. Because fire will burn chaff. Fire will burn addictions. Fire will burn weaknesses. Fire will refine him. It is a refined man that practices principles. Because what you call the principle is the nature of a spirit. It's a spirit that is holy. So when you receive that spirit, you begin to live the principles of holiness. So you are not just external in, in your oppression. You are intrinsic in oppression. What you practice is who you are. So it's no longer you trying to do something. It is you expressing life the way you breathe. So the way God prunes, we said in the morning, it is by what? The baptism of fire. And I said, what is fire? There are three things about fire. Because when this baptism comes to you, there are certain things that will begin to happen to you. The first thing that will happen to you is that there will be an intense hunger activated in your spirit for the presence of God. When a man begins to pursue the presence, he is on fire. Something has happened to him. He doesn't know it. It is not natural for man to seek God. It is natural for man to pursue things. But when a man begins to pursue God, something has happened on his inside. There is a fire that has been kindled on his inside. That fire is what we call the passion, the zeal of the Lord. And in John chapter 2 verse 17, Jesus said, the zeal of my father's house, he said, it has consumed me. A generation that does not seek after God but the things that God has to offer will be a puppet in the hands of the devil. You will not know it until they become mighty. If God is not his pursuit, wait until he's empowered. And you'll be shocked who he truly is. The guy that comes to church to sweep, suddenly we tell the pastor, meet me at home. Because something has changed. So when that fire comes, the first thing it does is that it kindles a hunger in your spirit. 
Unfortunately, many are not aware how significant that hunger is. So they have bought it. And it's so pathetic what people have bought hunger on. Some have bought hunger on the altar of gossip. Some have bought hunger on the altar of movies. They watch, I have, I have been a victim. I know what I'm telling you by experience. I went for a revival conference. I was set on fire, burning with flames. And then I came to the house. And suddenly, my sister brought a movie. Say, it's Kyle X Y. Try Kyle X Y. They say the best thing. It, it was designed in a physics lab. And I looked at it. I say, when I heard physics, I say, okay. My pride came. I'm a scientist. Let me see what they are saying. And then I looked, and I looked one episode. I looked two episodes, and I sat down. And we finished one. We finished two. We finished three. We watched Kyle X Y for one week. When we finish, they now say, Ah, have you seen Prison Break? That is more than Kyle's wife. And they told us about Michael Schofield. Michael Schofield. And then I sat on Michael Schofield. We watched Prison Break for close to two weeks. We will be tired. We will carry pillow and sit on pillow. Because we sat down until every part of our body began to pain us. So we had to look for something to, to provide succor. So we lied on, we laid on pillow. And when we finished Prison Break, they now say, Ah, I have not seen anything now. Do you know Alexander Mahon? Ah, they say 24 is the, is the king of... And then we start on 24. And two months pass, we're watching prison break. When I finished, I went to the room again. I thought I prayed through the night by human strength. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I slept up. I said, I wanted to fast by 10 a.m. Hunger wanted to kill me. And I now went and said, Kai, only the living serve the Lord. I need to eat. I will start next week. And I didn't know when fire diffused from my spirit. And suddenly the God that was so close to me that I could literally perceive his breath, God became fire. And accessing the presence of God become like Johnny Mount Sinai. I say, what has happened? Fire has gone. It is the intelligence of darkness. It is the way of this world. The way of this world is the way of lust. It is the way of appetite. It is the way of seduction. But when God into a man with fire. He quenches the appetite. He deadens the seduction. He mortifies the flesh. And that man sustains one pursuit. The presence. You will have so much strength that you will be amazed. And most times what you don't know is that that energy is a gift from God. I told us in the morning, some of the things we do that we think we are doing it because we are special. They are entrusted to us as custodians. Many generations before us, certain men have handled it. And when that thing rests upon you, it will bring a new government over your life. Because the man who downloaded that dimension, if that man was in the cave, if that thing rests upon you, your life will be a solitary life. One person can be walking healing and he is permitted to be in the public. Another person will be walking healing and he will be in the cave. Because there are different mantles trapped by different personalities. So when the spirit of Elijah comes upon John, Elijah will leave his civilization. John will leave his civilization and go back to the cave. Because the person who downloaded the mantle was in the cave. So most times when the fire comes, the fire is teaching you the protocol of the presence. So that you can, you can be able to administer that which has rested on your life. But many times we are bought it because we are not aware that what we are doing and the corridor that we are walking upon, many patriarchs have walked upon those corridors. And right now they are looking on us from Zion, hoping that by all means we will not only be able to do that which the mantle came to deliver, but we will be able to hand it over to another generation. And the only way to carry that mantle from one generation to another is by sustaining the fire. We are a distracted generation, so we act a lot of drama. We think that when we do certain things in a certain way, things will happen. We don't know how sacred the things committed to us are. The first protocol of fire is a hunger for the presence. The second thing that fire does is that it purifies. Rules and regulations are important, but they are the most basic level of spiritual realities. When a man is set on fire, what that fire does is that he burns off every connection between that man and his world. The first responsibility of fire is the seduction to God's presence. The second responsibility of fire is to purify. 
When you see people living in iniquity, their fire has gone out long before now. I know a lot of people struggling with addictions. They come and cry. They don't want to do it again. Some even injure themselves. Some beat themselves. Some put a lot of weight on themselves. Yet they see themselves doing it again. The reason is because that thing is an appetite in their spirit man. Until fire comes, it will not be burnt off. So when fire comes upon the life of a man, what it does is that it purifies. I told us in the morning, the realm of God, fire has its own operation. In the realm of man, fire has its own operation. In the realm of the devil, fire has its own operation. In the realm of the devil, fire torments. In the realm of man, fire burns. But in the realm of God, fire purifies. That was why the prophet, a national prophet, ascended to heaven. And he thought when he came there, he would stand with fellow prophets. But when he came there, he knew, he didn't know that credential in that realm is not a gift. Among men, your gift can be a great credential. So if I come here and I pray for somebody is healed, you say it's a great man of God. If I look at somebody and I begin to call your name by word of knowledge, you say it's a great man of God. But in the realm of these spirits, these things don't exist. Sickness don't exist here, so they don't need a healer. It's a realm of a perpetual continuum. So people know as they are known. So word of knowledge is not necessary. So if you come to that realm, what gives you relevance there is the level of purity that you carry. So the prophet showed up. Even though he was a national prophet, they didn't have recognition for his gift. And himself began to introduce himself. He said, woe unto me. That's not part of the prophetic syllabus. You can't be woed. You are a prince among men. You are a gifted man. You are a, ro- you are a monarch among mortals. How come you are suddenly cursed? You are cursed because you are impure. If your garment is stained in that realm, you are cursed. So when he showed up, he said, woe unto me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't talk here. Because the people that talk here, the credentials they have to speak is purity. And one of the angels told him, you are gifted, but you have need of fire. So he took one of the coals from the midst of the stones of fire, and he touched him, and he purged him, and he said, now you can talk. May we not leave this world with popularity, influence, and the applause of men, and go to that realm and be a cost. <laughs> May men not clap for us, but the angels boo us. May we not be popular among men, but in the realm of the spirit we are in disgrace. Because of the things we thought we did in secret. The things we thought were hid, not knowing that there are spirits of just men made perfect, that are a part of the cloud of witness watching. When fire comes, it purifies. Your secret life will become stronger than your public life. The testimony of your secret life will become stronger than the testimony of your message on the prophet. And what will give your message validation will not be how that it is preached. It will be with purity. The purity with which it is communicated. So fire comes to give us a witness in the heavens. When a man becomes pure, he has a witness in the realm of God. When a man is impure, he may have record among men. But when a man is pure, his witness is first of all before God. I know a prophet that born like, like a blazing furnace. His name is Elijah. When Elijah came to talk to the king, he said, Before God, whom I stand. I don't talk to you because I have rank among men. I talk to you because I have rank in the name of God. I'm a witness in Zion. I stand before God. I have authority in the realm of God. This is the kind of Christianity that can change this world. If you contemplate the level of darkness that is coming into this world, you will marvel. We will marvel. Our corporate witness must become strong enough to challenge darkness. But the way that will happen is when the people talking on earth are pure. If the people praying are impure, there will be no witness in Zion. No matter how many we are, we will have no witness. You know the 21st century church is a church that succeeds by crowd, not by stature. So when you see few people gather, you trivialize them. You assume nothing is happening here. That's the 21st century church, not the church of the patriarchs. The church of the patriarchs, the point came where they split themselves and churches were in people's houses. They were more interested in stature, not congregation. So 10 people can gather in one place and build themselves until all of them become strong. And one of them can go to Samaria and take the city. But the 21st century church, we think our glory is only in the crowd. Crowd is important, but stature is more important. The people who gather, are they pure? 
This is why we are on fire. When we talk about fire, it's not for young people jumping on the altar. I told us you can jump because you are 25. When you become 60, you will discover what you are working with is adrenaline. Because if what's powering you is the Holy Spirit, even at 60, you will be born with purity. Nothing will be strong enough to defy you. Nothing will be potent enough to take you down. That man is a witness. He doesn't even need to preach. Anything he does is a witness. That man can stand up and tell stories and his story will be a witness. That man can stand up and sing a song. His song will be a witness. That man can preach a message. His message will be a witness. He doesn't need to be a pastor. I heard a story by Spirit Wigglesworth. He said many times when he's drained, there's a woman he goes to visit. Nobody knows her. And he didn't even bother calling her name. Every time, this is a national prophet, the apostle of faith. When he's drained, he can travel for many days to go and find that woman. And when he shows up, the moment he begins to talk to the woman, something begins to burn in his spirit. The woman is literally a furnace. So the man comes to kindle himself at the woman's place. Anytime he's drained, the prophet goes. I heard story. The, most of the general overseers you see in Lagos today, once in a year, they go to Ibadan to find out the descendants of Babalola. Most of them, they lay hands on them once in a year. They are general overseers with big churches. But they know men who carry dimensions of God that can never be played in essence. They are given to pure, pure men. It was Benihim that told us the story. A young rabbi was living at the foot of the mountain. Where a family lived, a wealthy man in Israel, on top of the mountain, very wealthy. But the daughter was possessed. They brought every kind of popular person. Nothing worked. Meanwhile, this man doesn't go out of his room. He prays in tongues every day from morning to night. Benihim said, when these people did everything, they, worked, they brought imams, they brought all kinds of people. They now said, well, this man that is always disturbing us downstairs, who doesn't go out? Let's try him out. So they went to the man. May God give us something that is tangible. When they went to this man, the man said he was coming. That they should go, he's coming. And the man was in the room doing his morning devotion. And usually his morning devotion will finish by 4 p.m. You know, you know why our morning devotion end very fast? We are earth. When you go to heaven, sometimes as you ascend in the spirit, the worship going on there will keep you for three hours. You will not say anything. You will just be quiet. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. Oh, he oh, you will do that for three hours. Then you will start thanking God. You may thank God for another three hours. By the time you say you want to pray, it's evening. <laughs> may God take us deep. We are shallow. I'm telling you, we are shallow. When the man finished morning devotion, meanwhile, this is the Christian, the Christianity that was handed to us. I remember how that young believers, very few years ago, five, six, seven years ago, every weekend, you see a friend call his friend, where are we going this weekend? And on Friday, as they come back from school, they are going somewhere to come back on Sunday evening. What are they going to do? They are going to pray. You can't find such things anymore. All of us want to preach on the altar because we think preaching is more important than intimacy. When evening came, the man stood up. And as the man began to climb the mountain, the moment the man started coming, the gear began to scream in the room, Don't come here. Don't come here. Don't come here. And the man was climbing. The man was climbing. As the man was approaching, the demons were leaving. The demons were leaving. The demons. When the man reached the door, every spirit had left the girl. When he came in, he told the dear, The Lord bless you. The Lord caused his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance above you. And the Lord give you peace. And he turned back. He didn't come to talk to the demon. He carried so much fire that no demon could look upon him. You can't see him. You can't look. The guy carries so much intensity. 
that the demons could not look upon him. Did you not read about Jesus? There were many times when Jesus casted out demons. But there are certain times when Jesus returned from the mountain. The moment he enters the synagogue, they begin to scream. They begin to run. He came with a brilliance that challenged darkness. I told you, in the realm of God, fire is purity. But in the demonic realm, fire is torment. So when a pure man is coming, every spirit that is not of God is tormented. So your presence around their ambience becomes a torment to them. The moment the man showed up, the demons left. That is power. That is said is tired of Rema. I teach a lot of mysteries. But I'm seeing young people like myself that need to be genuine. Because our destiny is still ahead of us. Our destiny is still ahead of us. I told us in the morning, if you save an old man, you save a life. But when you save a young man, you save a destiny. You save a generation. If we took an honest census here, you'd be amazed that 97% of the young people here have one addiction or the other. Why? There's no fire. Meanwhile, all of us can pray in tongues very loud. All of us can scream and shout. We are spending from adrenaline. When a man is on fire, he's pure. And the third thing fire does. Do you love the presence of God? Do you love the presence of God? When was the last time you stayed up all night just to talk to God? He said, King do me. He said, kiss me with the kisses of thy mouth. He said, thy love is better than wine. The word is, King do me with fire. King do me with passion. He said, draw us. And we will come after thee. Draw us. He said, we will not remember the testimony of the wine. That's the man that has departed from the seduction of this age. There is something that powers him. He said, the love of my bride, of my groom, is sweeter than wine. The presence. The fire that purifies. And thirdly, what fire does is that it energizes you for destiny. That's where impact comes in. He said, he naked his angels spirits, but his ministers flames of fire. In the last day, exegesis will not be enough. In the last day, theological intelligence will not be enough. In the last day, it will only be enough if fire comes out of your spirit. When men hear you, they are, they've heard a lot of things. There are many revelations everywhere. If you go on YouTube now, as I'm talking to you now, there are over 500 preachers preaching now. If you go on Facebook, there are over 500 preachers preaching. Every song you need now is a click away. Just type the name or the name of the artist it will come out and you will hear it anywhere. The scarcity of revelation is not there. But there is scarcity of fire. And it is only by fire we can make impact. Remember, he said he will prune you so that you will bring forth fruit and your fruit will abide. So the idea behind the pruning, the idea behind the project is for you to be able to break through the stronghold of darkness and raise a generation for God. How will that happen? It's by fire. Who told you a harlot will listen to an intelligent message and stop fornicating? Who told you a drunk will listen to your message and stop drinking? Who told you a liar will listen to your message and all of a sudden he will stop because your message is reasonable? There must be an element of fire in your message that coats the heart of that person. The Bible said something. It said, the spirit of this world has blinded their hearts. These guys are darkened. They are not doing what they are doing just because they enjoy it. They are doing what they are doing because there is a spiritual element that has darkened their hearts. Our labor now is the labor of knowledge. We know all the doctrines. We know all the exegesis. We know all the rema. We have notes for every kind of meeting. We have scriptures. But we don't have fire. So we preach our intelligent messages. Yet nothing happens. 
something is wrong. The army cannot rise. There can be no impact unless there is fire. The souls will not be won unless there is fire. Most of the people you go out to preach to, they know what you want to say. They listen to you out of courtesy. Because morally where they were brought up, there is respect for God. So because you say you came in the name of the Lord, they say, okay, finish. I was driving home from a vigil last two weeks ago. And as I was turning around my house, I saw the Newcastle Resort. I thought it was an event center. And over 30 cars were parked close to 3 a.m. in the morning. I said, what is happening here? I parked my car to look. The next thing I saw, three young ladies came out. One of them was smoking something. And what they wore was not, it didn't even as much as cover up to their tie. That was when I knew another club had come there. And I told myself, you say you are a revivalist. You heard the story of Finney. You heard the story of Rehab Bunker. Can you enter this club and preach to these people? Stop deceiving yourself when you see Christians that understand short language. And then when you say what they want to hear, they jump up. Go and talk to these people if you can win a soul here. I was grieved in my spirit. And I knew that we truly need power. Most of the people that meet us in church, this is what they do. The only difference is that when they come to church, they wear the kind of clothes we want them to wear. They have other clothes in their box that we don't know about. Because if you enter that club, you will not find Amina. You will find Magdalene. You will find Mary. You will find Doreen. You will find Monica. You will find Jessica. All of them belong to one or two congregations. But there is no fire. There is no fire. And I told myself, if I can't preach here, where should I be able to preach? So I come to places where people know the message I'm supposed to preach. So when I say it, they corroborate. When I say it, they conform to it. They clap because they think what I'm saying is right. It's not because there is any impact. And I went home. I pitied myself. And from that day, I started praying to God. He said, give me power. I came here out of respect, sir. I know I shouldn't be preaching now. I came here out of respect. The same scriptures we quote, they are men that didn't quote as much, but they took their word. Billy Graham preached John 3.16 for 68 years. John 3.16, and he took his word. We quote 50 scriptures, yet the sinner goes back a sinner. The drunk goes back a drunk. When they come to church out of respect, they dress decently. But that's not who they are. If you see who they are, you will weep over the people that you say you are preaching to. And when these people are jumping, we are excited. No. Impact comes when there is fire. I rather win 10 people that stand than to have 100 people that are seen as walking with me. It's so pathetic in our generation that it is among pastors that is worse. If you know how many pastors are living in immorality, you will cry. Most people are honestly on fire until they went for a program. Until they heard the message. A brother was fasting for three days. Praying in tongues. And he was praying the message of an apostle. A known apostle. And while he was playing the message, he saw himself being seduced in a dream. And he began to fornicate. And then he was hearing the voice of the apostle, but he was saying a different thing in the dream. Because in the realm of reality, it is your essence that is communicated. You can be preaching an intelligent message in, in the natural. In the spirit, it's your reality that you are saying. And the guy woke up, had wetted himself everywhere. And he started crying. Say, what is this? Many people are genuinely on fire until they go to listen to certain people. And the moment they listen to them, they transfer the spirits that power them. Right message, wrong life. Because there's no fire. We are moved by crowds. But even we talking know that we are not accurate with God. And we are no longer pursuing accuracy. Because there are many cheap platforms. You can go on Facebook and have followers. So you don't have regard for the altar anymore. In the days of the fathers, when somebody labors for a long time before he can take a city, he knows the price of souls. I told myself something must happen. And the first thing that needs to happen to us is a genuine baptism of fire. That is why if there is anything in your elements that negate God, 
before you pursue anything, make sure it is dealt with. You stay with that thing until it is decimated from you. That is the only time you can have impact in this kingdom. Because most times what we call impact is not impact. Most times what we call impact, it is a rating according to human standard. Before you say you have 10,000 followers, find out if that thing that has been in your spirit is still there. That, that masturbation, that fornication, that addiction that you carried for 10 years, if something has not been done to it after 10 years, it means you are sick in the spirit. So before you check your popularity rating, find out for how long have this addiction been here. I've suffered loss for seven years. How long will this loss be here? I've suffered masturbation for ten years. How long will this masturbation be here? Before you call yourself a prophet or an apostle, go back to the refiner's fire. He said, the Lord that you seek will suddenly appear in his sanctuary and he will thoroughly pour the sons of Levi that they may bring an offering unto God in righteousness. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2. An offering in righteousness. Because the Bible said every one of us, he said our work will be tried by fire. Whether it will stand or it will fail. When you come up to minister and what motivates you is in the flesh. Stop and begin. Doesn't die, hand over the mic and go and sit down. You would have done a better work that day than preaching a very bogus message. If you come to the altar and what is tearing you is the flesh, stop. You rather pray to the end. The people may think you are praying and provoking something in the spirit, you are helping your soul. And if your session is for one hour, pray for one hour and go and sit down. The people are better disappointed, but God disappointed in you. Than they clap for you and yet you do nothing. Because when you continue over time, your conscience will become dead. And it will not matter anymore. You can stand up from the bed of fornication and lead the congregation of God. And you call it worship. You are joking. You can stand up from a bargain of lies and stand preaching. Thinking you are preaching method. You are joking. There will be no reward. Because it will be burnt in fire. And this fire that purges now, if we don't allow that fire to purge us, it will purge us at the last day. Because the Bible went further to say, if your work is burned by fire, it said yourself will be saved, but by fire. And I'd rather be burnt on earth than to be born in eternity. I'd rather allow the fire to try me on earth than to try me in eternity. Fire kindles a passion for the present. Fire kindles for purity. And fire is the raw material for genuine kingdom impact. That pawnings of God. That flames of the Holy Spirit that drives you to do what you do. When you function by that energy, you are accurate with God. I said the second baptism that purges and prunes us for great impact for more in this kingdom is the baptism of suffering. White fire is an organic thing. Suffering. <laughs> suffering is not just in your heart. It affects every part of your constitution. It affects both your mind and your body. One of the ways God re-engineers a man is by the intelligence of suffering. There are many things God will say you will never hear until you go through a circumstance. There are many things that will be preached on the altar you won't hear. I know, full of myself, arrogant and proud. When you are preaching a message, I say, I'll look around and say, thank God. Hey, thank God Matthew came to church today. He should hear this message. He needs to hear this message. Meanwhile, what me I'm hearing? Ah, this, this message that I was trying to preach, I've received the scripture that will complete it. So me, I'm receiving building blocks for preaching. And then I assume in my arrogance that somebody else needs to hear it. And then I had a lot of sermons, a lot of sermons. Intelligently outlined, exegetically structured. But my life was in disarray. 
until God allowed me to come to the altar of suffering. And I suffered a lot. Because I failed many classes. There are certain things God will allow me to go through a circumstance that I should have learned. I will actually not learn. I will follow and that same thing will keep me. There were certain things that made me go through terrible embarrassment over three times. That was when I knew that there are certain languages that go deeper into a man. Some of them are not verbal. Some of them are circumstantial. So when God wants to shape a man, most times what he does is that he exposes him to a certain degree of suffering. Let me show you some scripture. I told you already from 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1 from verse 7 to 8, what happened to Paul. Paul was the teacher of faith, but he didn't trust God. He was a very intelligent man. He was trained by the best. He said in the doctrine, he is better. He excelled all in his class. The guy was the best in what he did. But his best was in the natural. So God could not approve of him. The only way God taught him genuine trust was when God allowed him to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. And he said, I will not allow you to be ignorant of the suffering that we went through in Asia. He said, the verdict of death was upon us. We despaired even of life. He said, but on that ground, we learned to trust God. And the point came, the trust Paul had was so intense that in Philippians 3 verse 3, he said, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Having no confidence in the flesh. I've come to a point where I tried everything I knew it failed. That's why in this kingdom, speed is not a function of sprinting. Speed is actually a function of passing your classes. Because you can preach on the largest altar in Nigeria, but you will go nowhere. You will wear your best suit, preach your best message. When you step out, nobody will remember you. Because it's not a platform that elevates you. You are elevated based on the class you are currently in, in the spirit. If you are still in a kindergarten class, if you like, go and preach in the university, nobody will hear. Because you can't talk there. Your witness does not have the stature to represent there. One of the things that causes a man to be promoted in the spirit are the verdicts of suffering that he is able to endure. When he endures it, he becomes strong in the spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul said, I recall unto you that the suffering of this present world, the suffering of this present world, Because there are many things we can't learn by reading the Bible. Some of the things we will learn by reading our circumstances. So God will deliberately allow you to go through the fire. God will deliberately allow you to go through the circumstances. So that you will realize that your confidence cannot be in yourself. That's when you become strong. You are not strong because you are muscular. You are strong because you rely on God. But you will never get there. You know when I started preaching, I thought preaching was about eloquence. I'd listen to every speech by Obama. I'd listen to speeches. <laughs> I listened to American presidents. Almost all the American presidents. I hear them. I sit down and listen to them for hours. I heard people like Winton Churchill. I heard people. Orators. The best orators. And those days, if I want to dwarf my audience, I will lower my voice. The discipline is the soul of an army. It makes more number formidable. It procures success to the weak and esteem to all. And then people will be like, wait, say it again, say it again, say it again. And I'll say, okay, wait, 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 calm down, calm down. At the end of the day, when they were clapping for me, I was an orator. But I didn't carry life. I now realize oratory is never a part of this business. This is the business of witnessing. And to be a witness, you must be carried there to see it firsthand. The guy you bring to the court to be a witness for you, the court is not moved by his oratory. They want to find out whether he has an exhibit. Were you there when it happened? So they know whether you are an eyewitness. It is what you have seen and heard that you declare. Not what you can see. And most of the time, the only way you can look through the oracles of God is when you allow God to carry you through the circumstances. When those things begin to happen in your life, then you know that God is truly pruning you. A point will come when you will discover that patience is not a function of Bible study. You will now discover that 
Many times things happen to you and you moved in the flesh. The first time you slapped somebody's wife, you now went to the prison. And you were there for six months. Next time when you want to slap, you will hold your hand like this. And then you will think. The last time you rebuked an authority, you were not promoted for four years. So in that four years, you will have four years sober reflection. So next time before you talk, you will say, wait, this thing I want to say, is it right? You will now consider every party in the game. Then you will now realize that no, you don't challenge authority. Reason with them when they give you an opportunity, you become wise. Because when pastor is saying be patient, you think pastor wants to oppress you. That's why he's teaching you this thing so he can do what he wants. Because the concept of life is also a teacher. You wanted to sneak and do that thing quickly. And the day you tried it, the flashlight opened and they caught you. You now stood like this. <laughs> you don't know whether you say, God, deliver me, or God, have mercy, or God, restore me. You now stood like this. You now discover it is vain to be smart in your head. So one of the things the baptism of suffering does is that it builds in us the character of the spirit the nature of god it is god's way of bending us it's god's way of chiseling us until his nature can be seen through us the fire empowers you to do what you do but the nature is your stamina whether you will last or not is the strength that comes because of the things that you've gone through you know daddy gave an example in the morning they can tell you preach one message this Sunday, and then you have eight days to prepare, and then you pray in tongues for five, five hours every day, and you came on Sunday, you say, Lord, Father, and everywhere scatter. And then when you are coming out of the church, you are feeling that you are more anointed than the pastor. So when daddy calls you, you now say, hey, God help us, God help us, God help us. When they now say, okay, preach on Wednesday again, you still go and pray in tongues, pray in tongues. When you preach on Wednesday, they say, preach on Sunday again. You now preach, they say, preach the next Wednesday. They now say, when you preach ten times in three weeks, you will discover your message is exhausted. <laughs> you will check all your textbook is gone. You, will, you would have quoted one scripture twenty times. Then you now discover that, wait, what is happening there? Apostle Aram calls it the Z coordinate. There are certain things we learned when, when we, were, we, were, we were betrayed. That one is part of the doctrine. It's not... So, <laughs> when you want to teach strength in the spirit, we can open the doctrine of betrayer. And you will teach from that betrayer. And you will teach for three months. And then when you finish with betrayer, you will talk again from the time when you were stranded. The things you learned from God when you were traveling to Obomo Show and the cast point. Meanwhile, God told you, don't travel today. But you went to say you are a man of faith. You have learned something. There is another part of faith that you have learned. Because it's through faith and patience that you obtain the promise. You didn't know that faith worked with patience. Now that you are stranded on the road, you will be forced to speak in tongues through the night by the roadside. When you do that in the morning, and they repair the car after three days, you didn't have money in your pocket. You fasted for three days. When next God say, Michael, you say, yes Lord, I'm here. So you can teach them the voice of God from an experiential perspective. Because you have learned. That's how men become strong. The nature of God is walked into them. You can't understand love. You can't understand patience. You can't understand long suffering. Except God begins to allow your circumstance to open the messages that they have been preaching to you to you. That's when you will discover that message you thought was a weak message carried a lot of wisdom. The message you trivialized because the pastor was not shouting. That's when you will discover that message you need to hear it five times. You will go back and carry your archive and open the message that was preached three years ago. And when you hear it this time, you will hear it with repentance. There were many messages I heard before. I said, what is this person talking about? Is this... Come on, come on. If I hear them now, I repent. Because I passed through certain things. And I realized if I knew those things they said, I wouldn't have had need of passing through the path that I followed. The doctrine of suffering builds you to carry the nature of God. The question tonight is, how do you find to flame the fire? How do you keep yourself consistent? You know, Paul was a wise man. When Paul gave his heart to Christ, 
God went on a honeymoon with Paul. See, there are few men that God did this business with. If you study the scriptures in Exodus, you will see that God went on a honeymoon with Moses. When God wants to start a new order with people, most of the time He separates them with the knowledge and the doctrine of the age. He brings them into Himself and teaches them something unique because He wants to bring a fresh witness. These are the kind of men that enjoy God's honeymoon. Moses, God was seducing him to Horeb. He didn't know that Horeb was the mountain of God. And he was walking around Horeb for 40 years until one day he saw a bush burn that was not consumed. Now, in the wilderness, it's natural for bush to burn. But for Moses to notice that a bush is burning and it's not consumed, it means Moses have learned to pay attention to spiritual things. He saw a bush burning that was not consumed. And he said, wait, I will look. I will turn aside and look. And when he came, God said, take off thy shoes. For where you are standing is the holy ground. And Moses drew near. And God began to educate Moses. God began to teach Moses the protocol, the sequences, the requirement of becoming a deliverer. And when God finished packaging Moses, he said, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. Because of the level of intimacy you have attained, you cannot stand on the same scale with mortals. That was the kind of experience Paul had. When Paul gave his heart to Christ, God carried Paul to the wilderness of Arabia. And once and again, the light of God appeared to him and taught him things that no man knew. He said, the doctrine that I received, I was not taught of men. He said, it pleased the Father to reveal the Son in me. He had entered a honeymoon with God. Paul was so deep in matters of revelation, so apt in matters of doctrine, but when Paul came out, he discovered that there are certain things that God allows circumstances to teach you. So that stamina can be built. So that capacity can be built. So that weight can be developed in the spirit. This thing I'm sharing now, if a man that has deeper experience is sharing it, the weight will be different. We can say the same thing, but the weight will be different. The weight is the testimony of the values that you have walked through. And God allowed Paul to journey through certain weeds, through certain valleys, through certain dark alleys, so that he can see the light that is not the sun, the light that beams from the realm of God. How do you stay stable when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death? How do you fan your fire to flame? How do you stay stable in the valley of the shadow of death? I want to show you two things and then we'll begin to pray. You ancient science king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O fountains of the deep, cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. If I ask you now, what have you been through for the sake of the gospel? What will you tell me? If I ask you now, what have you endured for the witness of Christ? What would you say? But most times we think we have more stature because we are more gifted. It's called a gift because it's a gift. So God doesn't rate men according to gift. That's why no ordination in the scripture is done on the basis of a gift. They are done on the strength of character. They are done on the basis of of stamina in God. Those are the two things that the, 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 the heavenly creatures count. What can you stand for God? What can you endure for Jesus? What are the scars that you have sustained on account of this gospel? All of us want to be in the limelight. Do you know why we dishonor fathers in our generation? It's because ourselves don't have any track record. If you have a track record, you'll be careful who you talk to. Many young people my age, they come on Facebook and they are challenging Bishop David Oedeko. Who are you talking to? You can vanish from this generation. There will be no, nobody we know. Everything you have done 
a thousand times can vanish inside of his own record. Who told you? <laughs> if you are placed on the scale with him, God will choose him and forget you. In kingdom business, not in law for salvation now. In salvation we are all equal, but in the kingdom we are different. Because kingdom is God's business. All your children can be equal by birth. But when it comes to service, your first son who is 30 years old is the one you talk to, not your baby that is 3 years old. We challenge fathers because we have no track record. If you have track record, you be careful. In 1979, Bishop Oedeko called for three days fast for Nigeria. You started praying for Nigeria in 2015. And then you are talking and talking down on him. You don't know what intercession for Nigeria means. In 1988, Wale trekked around the whole country in three days, praying three, three hours every day in every state of this country for God to visit the country. And then you stand up today because you have preached in Enugu and Newi. You now say, ah, they say, but don't know what they are saying. <laughs> you are a novice. You are about to fall into the condemnation of the devil. He said, do not exhort a novice. First Timothy 3 verse 7. He said, lest he will be lifted up and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Because you pray for two sick people, they are healed. He now stand up and say, you know, um, the way the healing anointing works, when it comes upon me, I can, that's why, that's how I do what I do. Which healing anointing are you talking about? Reverend Chris did his first crusade in 1980. Where were you? Do you know Jesus? Were you born? And if you were born, have you heard the name Jesus Christ? 1980. And then you come and say, well, uh, it's the anointing. Which anointing are you talking about? Do you know the anointing? Because there's no doctrine of suffering. There's no doctrine of labor. There's no doctrine of track record. We just jump up and we say what we want. We are actually not on fire. Because the character of God has not been formed. When the fire comes through suffering, what it does is that it brings the shape of Christ out of your soul. You can carry a gold, a gold slab, and it will have no value. But when you carry it through the fire, the dross will come out of it. And that gold can become a ring. That gold can become anything, and the value changes. We've not gone through fire. And we've not gone through suffering. That's why we talk without coordination. But a generation must have to repent. So that God can entrust to us a heritage for the next generation. Never find yourself in a place where you talk against authority. Never. I don't care if I end here. But I want somebody to hear. You will never go far. The Bible said for this cause many are sick. For this cause, many, they sleep, not discerning the lost body. We are not equal in this body. There are those who came before us. And there are those who are handling more responsibility beyond us. There must be order. There must be honor. He said the army of the last day will not break their ranks. You can't break ranks in this kingdom and expect to be promoted. Where will you go to? You have violated the structure, the cadre of the spiritual. How will you be promoted? From what to what? Our subject is pruned for more. I'm saying this thing because the reason many people remain small, this is it. You spoke against somebody that is an authority in the spirit. And so long as you stand there, you will never grow. Because you have violated the very ladder, ladder of growth in the kingdom. You are doing church ministry and you are talking against those who have been doing church 30 years before you were born. You will go nowhere. Apply all the principles of church growth. It will not work. You came to a territory. Those who are laboring there before. You assume they know nothing. You are an elite. When you labor for a long time. The demons in the land will tell you. We don't know you. This is why we can't have more. We narrowed ourselves. We reduced our possibility by the things we utter. There must be regard for authorities. He said, these ones don't have regard for entities. 
It's even Michael, the archangel, did not bring railing accusation against Lucifer. He only said, the Lord rebuke you. This is how men grow. Most of us have large and great destinies. But the very custodians of the mantle which we inherit, we have fought them. So the mantle will reject us. Some of us today are supposed to become the next apostles rising from Africa. But we have fought the apostles that rose. Because we didn't have discernment. We are not pruned. When you go through certain paths in life, it will narrow your utterance. I thought I knew it once. I met Apostle Arumi. And I stayed there. And I stayed there. And as I stayed, God kept increasing me. God kept increasing me. I'm not doing anything different from what I was doing. I was even more rugged before than now. My friend knows me. Some years ago now, I don't want to say those days. Because there are no those days. We are in these days. My friend will buy Tom Tom for me every day. I had fasted for five years. It looked as if my intestine was decaying. I can't talk calmly like this. The energy will, will overtake me. My nerves will literally want to collapse. My stomach was literally decaying. He took it as a responsibility to be by me sweet. Yet, with that intense fasting and prayer, I, go, I went nowhere. Nobody knew me. Until a man looked at me and said, Come up here. He said, Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. And suddenly, he looked as if we are saying something new or doing something new. It's the same thing we are saying. But process taught us how to regard authority. And by our alignment with authority, we gain promotion. There are so many things we are praying for that doesn't need prayer. You only need to discern who has it and honor that thing and collect it. And some of it is not far away in Sokoto. It's right here in the church. You know, when an evangelist comes, everybody is hungry. They want him to come and scatter everywhere. The guy will scatter everywhere because he's preaching there for the first time. If he preaches here for 10 services, nothing will happen again. He will be forced to disciple. Because God is not scattering everywhere every day. God is raising men. And then when the evangelists go, you assume your pastor doesn't have anything. Follow your pastor when he also goes for a meeting outside. So your solution is lying with you, but you can't receive it. Because you are not pruned. You didn't go through this path, so you don't understand the labor of pastoring. That's why you can talk against one. Do you know what it means to be a servant of a spirit? You are not a servant of a spirit. You don't know the demands the spirit places on that man. Who told you you can say you can talk in that corridor? wake up and say we are from the same village so you go to challenge the native doctor in your clan you will die that you are from the same village doesn't mean all of you are the servant of that spirit who told you because you are a Christian you are, you are a servant of the Holy Ghost and then you can talk to the you don't know what is happening there keep quiet you will not go nowhere we receive impartations upon impartations upon impartations but we don't wonder why we don't go nowhere the reason is because we have reduced the space for growth. I know many young people that just came into the kingdom. And because they learned the right things, in two, three years, God exploded them. Meanwhile, there are other people that are in the kingdom for 20 years. They have not gone anywhere. And they can't see that the reason they are not promoted is themselves. They know everything, yet this thing they know is not taking them nowhere. And they will not repent. We must be pruned for more. And the way we are pruned sometimes is when God takes us through circumstances that teaches us how to be humble. That teaches us how to be patient. That teaches us how to honor. And suddenly, because you learn honor, suddenly because you learn patience, your chambers begin to open. And the same thing you are doing, all of a sudden, you do it and something happens. You are singing the same song you are singing and somebody hears it and says, how come you sang like that? And in one day your story changes. Then you know it doesn't take God anything to shift you. You were only the limitation in God's part. There are certain things in this kingdom that are stronger than impartations. One of it is life in the spirit. When you go through tribulations, when you go through trials, when you go through pain. Sometimes people come to you and complain what's happening to them. You can just see through the problem. Man of God, I don't know why I can't get married. This is the third relationship I'm in. 
And most times when they draw clothes, they break up. When they draw clothes, they just go. You are talking to me in so much arrogance if I was the one. Even me, the man of God, that will run for my life. So the man of God will tell him, thank God for the people that run. Because they would have died in your hand. The Bible says it's rather to stay on the rooftop than to share a house with a nagging woman. What is happening? Why are they saying? What is the meaning of this? I don't even know. I'm tired. I'm tired. And you came to the man of So most times when you are talking, the man of God is looking like this. What he's saying in his heart is, ah, how come you are not aware that you are your problem? And then you think the man of God will say, we rebuke the spirit of reproach. We cast out the demon. And the man of God will tell you, when next you want to talk, be patient. Don't talk loud. And you now say, ah, I came here to be married. Are you now counseling me? That is why you can't be married. You are your reproach. Prune for more. Somebody comes to you and says, he's trusting God for promotion. And while the two of you are here talking, he now begins to talk about somebody else who is succeeding. Say, so imagine this person. He thinks, he, he thinks there's anything special about him. See the way he's behaving. See the way he's talking. The same promotion you are looking for, you are fighting it to the people that have it. So you burnt the bridge that you should follow. But you didn't learn. This is how we are pruned for more. It's more of a character thing than it's an impartation thing. I don't even know why I'm talking like this. I came here this evening to set this place on fire. Why am I talking like this? That is a man of prayer. Maybe I'm being compelled. My utterances are being guided now. I want to be myself, but I can't. I don't know. I don't. Why am I talking like this? Let's pray in tongues for one minute. I want to ascend. I want to ascend. Pray the Holy Ghost. Pray the Holy Ghost. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Maraka sevilanaya, verekido sa brandatilia sa vade. Malalas. If you were truly blessed by this message, don't hesitate to like, share, subscribe so that anytime we drop related content, you will be the first to be notified.